there's a whole variety of reasons you might give for being here today. And, but it really comes down to one thing. And you know, they're all kind of variations on the theme. And that I think humanity intuitively now is getting that this big, complex, wonderful, crazy, destructive, giant global machine is in trouble. And that uh, you know, the military, industrial, corporatized way of running the world is running into problems in, in many different directions. And so I think humanity it, in a, as a whole is really getting that something's around the corner, something really big, and we need to be ready in whatever way we can be to do the best for ourselves, for our families, our communities, and the country. And it's not like there's a perfect roadmap for how to do that, because I, I don't claim to know exactly what's coming downstream. Um, and I don't think Rick know, claims to know that, and anybody who does claim to know that, I'm kind of suspicious. Uh, you know, maybe they've got the direct phone line to God, but uh, who knows? Anyway, there's a whole variety of scenarios, and we're going to be talking today about a variety of scenarios and about how to prepare for these things, how to deal with them and cope with them when they're happening. And, you know, it, it's going to be different for each and every one of us because we'll all be in a different spot in a different place. So our experience of it, and actually if there's a huge global event, there'll be some common experiences, but the experience of someone who's, say, in a city of 10 million people and the lights go out for two weeks, six months, a year, whatever, or, there's, or a city of you know, 10 million people and, and the earthquakes take down not six freeway interchanges like the major, last major L.A. earthquake, but if it's an order of magnitude of 10, instead of six, it'll be 600 or 6,000 bridges and in, in, in interchanges. And try and get around L.A., it was pretty bad when six interchanges fell down in the Northridge quake. Try to get around there when there's 600. But if you're in a rural community and the lights go out, your experience will be different. So this is, this is a, a work in progress. And we're all going to be learning today. It's a classroom. So we've got our PowerPoint presentations. And we've got some cool gadgets and things to demonstrate. But we also have a lot of knowledge. And you're going to have a lot of questions. And you're going to learn more probably or at least as much from your questions and our answers in the dialogue as you're going to learn from what we've got like up on the screen in the PowerPoints. So this is about a dialogue with a lot of people with a common interests, and it's about doing the best that you can, and none of us has all the answers. And so you're here to learn, we're here to learn, and we're here to, you know, to work together. So we encourage questions and dialogue and conversations. Um. What I started with was solar flares because uh, this is most likely going to affect all of you at some point in the next two years. NASA says uh, this will be the worst groups of solar flares in recorded history, rivaling those from the 1859 Carrington. And, um, we had a, a, a burp from the sun that was so incredibly bad that if it had even remotely been toward the earth, would have fried everything, including automobiles, where the chips were fried. That was how big it was. It was probably one of the biggest in recorded history. It went off it. It's on my website. You can get a picture of it. NASA did a nice little picture where they show the burp coming off, and it's staggering how much solar ejection is happening. If that had been at Earth, all your solid-state physics devices are, are sensitive. You know, your chips, they will fry, just like an ELM, uh, ELF spike. There are slightly different wave bands uh, predicated on what's coming off and the different kinds of ejections will affect our grid. If the grid goes down, that's what I did. So I'm saying when the next two years predicted. Okay, uh, Matt has other scenarios besides the coronal mass ones. If the mat was directed at the Earth like that picture, we would have been in dog meat, big time. And a zombie is uh, <laughs> East LA when they're out of food. And if, if you're, uh, even Reno, this big city, if we had an event, a global event, 
then what would have happened next is that within two and a half days, there would have been no food because everybody will panic. What little foods are left that nobody wants will also be taken. I have a picture of the way it looked like in Hawaii the day after Fukushima. And it is, I mean, once you see it, then you get how important it is because you're not going to be able to survive from the local. You're going to have to be on your own and to some extent with sanitation and with water and with your basic foods. So here we go. That's what it looked like in Hawaii the day after Fukushima. That is a picture of, from Kailua. And uh, I just thought, you know, they had their masks, of course. And look at those shelves. That is a local grocery store right down in the center of Kailua, you know, next to Uncle Bob, Uncle Bill. <laughs> The report states, uh, expect delays for up to two weeks. That means you should, like the Mormons, they have a whole year, you should at least have in your cupboards, you know, some backup things so that you can eat out of a can for a couple of weeks while they repair the grid. They will. It won't be that bad. Now, Maybe. I broke, and the reason I'm doing, why Matt and I are doing this is so that you have a way to organize priorities of what's important and what's important first. And the first thing before medicine, before weapons, before anything, is going to be your water. And um, so that's, cap that's part one. There are seven parts. And we'll talk about each one of those, and Matt will then get into the serious parts of developing that. Water facts. These are things you need to know. No. A person can only live three days without water. I did four and a half days in the Bering Sea, and I ended up surviving. I'm in the Guinness Book. The way I did it is I drank my own urine. That's how I survived. I, they missed a pickup. I would, did a naughty thing. I was out in the Bering Sea. No water, no nothing. Waiting for the sub. And I wasn't there. And I... Uh, <laughs> what saved my life was my ability to change my respiration and heart from biofeedback training I had. I went down into stasis and they found me. I was essentially blue. I had drinking as much as I could, and then I just went down into deep. And what I did when they found me, I dropped my heart down. I figured if I was going to die, I was going to do it the way I wanted to. And so what I did, I did everything I could to survive. And here I am. <laughs> lucky, lucky. <laughs> but it was drinking my own urine that saved my life. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And this is it. Now, an optimum amount, you need to all of you measure yourself you need, this is a little formula that is a bottom line, always mnemonic. Um, you need to take your weight. I'm 200 pounds. Divide that by two. That's 100 pounds. And then I need to drink 100 ounces a day. That's what you really need to pull it off. Now, you get your water from a lot of different things, but I don't think any of you in here are drinking like that. And when you're thirsty, when you're thirsty, that means you're 5% dehydrated. And when you're starting to get parched, you get to 10%. You're on verge of, of uh, all kinds of shock and other things that may happen to you predicated on your mind and your will. Uh, a lot of you can do, when you're down to the point where you're 10% dehydrated, you're in, you're in risk. And 5% is when you're thirsty. And most people are always thirsty and then they go below it out. Well, that means you are at least 5%. And what, what's 5% of uh, 100 ounces? That's the amount when you're thirsty. That's the amount you should be drinking. Use that as a little mnemonic. It it's varies with everybody, but just keep that focused. You should have purification tablets for protozoa and other kinds of organisms, like some deer decides to commit suicide up above you, and, you know, you get your coliform and all the rest of this bacteria is in the water, and it can be a real bad thing. In Oregon, where I live now, we have problems with arsenic because of the serpentine soils. And you need to know your water. Up in Washington and going into Canada, it's not as important as it gets warmer and down further south, where you have a lot of volcanic situations, your water's change, and you've got other kinds of goodies in there that necessarily are toxic, and you, you need to filter them. There's ways you can pot your water, you know, ceramic filters will take most of it out, but, you know, there's that other 1%, and I don't know if you know about Montezuma, but there it is. 
14 million people now drink contaminated water. And look at that, that little uh, water filtration plant there. That is a typical. In Grants Pass, we have watchdogs, and they're making errors every two or three days in the water. The waters are basically contaminated. In my area, we have H. pylori, which is a little uh, hydra that will cause indigestion and shit like that. But, and, and you can tell it. The way to get rid of H. pylori, anybody know? I like to do it with absence. Um, you know, you can go in with wormwood and rotor rotor yourself really good. Um, with absence, uh, with wormwood, the correct way to take wormwood to clean yourself, because we are the only country in the world that does not have a way to clean uh, rotor rotor. We all just presume our water's okay. And the bottled water there is toxic because, well, yeah, exactly. I don't drink out of that because the plastic changes the water structures. And right now your pH is probably 6.8. It's not even, it's probably at 6.8. How you regulate that is a little tiny bit of baking soda, just a little tiny bit of baking soda and you're good to go. You're looking for 8.4 to, 8.4 is your most optimum pH. And you, lip To explain that, um, in seven neutral. is and seven is well water. Water is neutral. It's not pot, It's not uh, acidic yeah. or, or alkaline. It's seven point oh. Yeah. Lower eight point four. It's alkaline. High numbers are basic. So alkaline is anything above seven. Acid is anything below seven. If you're, <laughs> it's 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 logarithmic. I don't drink this. this is so if you go like one digit above seven, it's slightly alkaline. One digit below, it's slightly acid. With each digit, it gets 10 times more basic, 10 times more acidic. Now, what I'm going to do, yeah, I'm going to just cover basics. Now, Matt has it down cold, why he uses one system over another, and these are the fine-tuning parts that you're going to want. These are just basics, but you need to boil water for at least 10 minutes if you're going to kill anything. By the time you reach boiling point, even at 20,000 feet, you far past pasteurization, and you've deactivated anything except for... Prions. So the, the truth of the matter is, and I talked to like the top um, scientists in water treatment and water safety, by the time you've reached boiling at pretty much any altitude, you've already killed everything that you can kill by boiling. And boiling does not touch anything that's chemically oriented, and it doesn't touch you. So no toxins will be affected by boiling. You need to do other things, but it will kill all the stuff you can kill if you boil it. And so boiling is very easy to kill stuff. Except mad cow disease, so you know if you're if you're starting to eat brains and, and neural connections, just be aware that if that looks like an animal that died a, some a, a grisly death, I would uh, <laughs> you know you don't want to get prions in your body. That's like mad cow disease and scraping. There's but, all but kinds of th- even there's not worse much of that around. Can't imagine you know so you don't really people. generally have to worry about it. But you know if it's ever a concern, avoid any kind of neural tissue in, in any kind of animal product you're eating. But oh. there's very little of that around, so it's not a huge concern. Wait, wait, wait. What about distilled water? Distilled water will take out... It depends on the distillation process. If it's straight distilled, it'll take out all of the toxic metals. It'll kill any bacteria. But if there's volatile solvents and things, then they'll distill out and recondense on the other side of the distilled water. So most... Higher quality home distillers are called multi-stage distillers. I make, I design water filters for my business, part of my business. So I'm a genuine expert, not the world's foremost expert, but I am an expert in the area. So a multi-stage distiller, it distills it, and then it also runs it typically through carbon so that all of the uh, volatile solvents that would evaporate along with the water and condense on the other side, they get sucked in by the carbon. So the chemicals and the heavy metals and the bugs, the straight distillation gets rid of them. But if you've got petroleum distillates and things in there, they'll go through the system in the distillation. Just like rain. And, you know, that's why you want to filter out all those dogs and cats. But really, um, the problem is that there's other things going on with water. And uh, Matt will cover that more. Okay, we're now going to move to part two, which is food. And food is your second thing. Because um, the average person is eating between 3,000 and 4,000 calories a day. And you should actually keep a diary and start monitoring because of the good things and the way you like to eat it. And, of course, uh, 
I'd like to, <laughs> I, that's a pretty straightforward, uh, you know, is that's how much sugar is in the Coke you're drinking right now and or these kinds of things that I'm drinking right now. These are not good for you. And the only reason I'm doing this is because I didn't have my access to my water like Matt carries his water from home. He's like right <laughs> on it. He's armored right out of the gate. And, uh, but the bottom line, I'm doing this one for the electrolytes mostly. Uh, uh, but sugar is the primary, and you know, so one of the things I found was when I was at Hilo, I said, you know, well, I'm going to go out and get a bunch of soybean and stack it in, and I said, what's your primary food that you eat? And when you start to think about what your primary diet is, <laughs> do you realize how much sugar you guys are all eating without even thinking about it? Look if you're eating processed coffees. food. Look at that, that's what I'm talking about, yeah. Starbucks. <laughs> okay, what else do eat Americans eat? Well, there's your basic foods, hamburger, <laughs> sugar, milk, cheese, and bread. And we're going to talk about this, but uh, it's unbelievable. I, I, you, what's a really interesting telling story is if you sat outside a supermarket and watched all the people and what they bring out of the store, and you did a little count, it's scary. <laughs> now, this says... A balanced meal right there. <laughs> yeah, you know, 15 ounces of can of chili with beans. There's 580 calories. One five-ounce can of tuna, 100 calories. There's one can of green beans, 50 calories. One 29 ounces of sliced peaches, 600 calories. And ramen, <laughs> total calories, 1710. Grams of protein, 17. That's a whole balance right there. If you want to lose weight... We're all overweight. Most of us are over. I'm 20 pounds over right now. The way I lose weight, and I'm doing it slowly, is that I do 1,200 calories a day. If I do 1,200 calories a day, I will absolutely lose weight. Absolutely lose weight. And it comes off correctly, so it doesn't go back on. Now that times, you want two weeks? <laughs> you have a bunch of ramen, you have a bunch of... On a budget, off the grid foods. These are like pinot beans, rice, five pounds of sugar, four pounds of lard, package of salt. So it'll cost only $2.50 a day for your food. You can actually get right down to survival modes if you want to. We, uh, later in Matt's talk, I will tell you how to wildcraft. We'll, if you want, instead of being in here, we'll walk outside and we'll walk around the plants and we'll pick food up and eat it. So you can see that right here in your own home, in this place, you can eat your environment, just like Gurdjieff said. Now, fresh sprouts. These are things you can grow. If you collect your seed, you can make your own proteins. You don't have to work it from animals and other kinds of things. There's a lot of ways that you can do. And this is about ready. And there's all kinds. Radish seeds, pumpkin seeds, any kinds of seeds. They're all good for you. And if you had a little tiny... Plate. They have these little kits that you can buy that go in your kitchen, you know, with a little green, a little green, you know, grow locks, and you're growing your own foods, and you got your basil, you clip it down, and it grows back. You, you know, you cook right from here. Uh, in permaculture, they say that in order to do that, your garden has to be 60 steps or less from your door, and if it's less than 60 steps from your door, you'll eat your food. That's the way that works, and you want to just keep that <laughs> mnemonic. The third is medicine. We haven't even gotten into some of the other ones like armor and all that. But medicine is part three. And uh, in every disaster, uh, illnesses and deaths that could be avoided. We, what we're doing now is we're starting to take stock of what happened in Katrina. What are the first diseases that start before anything else? Is it septus? Is it, you know, dehy Okay, we'll get there. Prescription medicine. If you uh, are on prescripts, like you have bad heart or something, that's part of what your go bag has. You know, it's your pharmaceuticals. Because if you should always have your medicines not in your cabinet, you should have them in a go bag. And I'm going to show you what go bags look like later. Matt brought his. I brought mine. They're quite different. Matt's is much better, of course. Mine is more <laughs> metaphysical. <laughs> Uh, well, you'll see why in, when I start pulling out my little toys. Uh, <laughs> you know, eagle bone whistle for pain instead of Vicodin. Um, I just, um, there is, you need 
to think about this part of it because what's the first thing that's going to get hit after an armor armory, you know, where the guns and things? What's the first, next thing that happens? Drugs. Of course. Dehydration is the first and foremost of all mass kill-off. Be, you know, like Katrina, that's the thing that killed people first, was dehydration. Before riots and zombies where they got eaten, it was dehydration. <laughs> And that's a fact. You can count on it that way. Uh, there I, there's a f- woman drinking her own urine. That will save your life if you have to. That's sterile. Your urine is the reason it's urine, not feces, is that it's been filtered and is uh, actually uh, dr- it's gross. You have no idea. But when you, <laughs> I have an idea. When you're below you, I'll, I'll zero trust you. in trust a rowboat, <laughs> in, a, in a lifeboat, and you don't have anything there, and they have, they're, where the hell are they? What do you do next? When you, you will try to drink the, that was in James Bond, when he gave the guy the oil to drink at the end of the movie, remember? And the guy ends up drinking the oil because he's so thirsty, he's got to have some kind of liquid. Yeah, and, and that's how bad... Dehydration will get when you get down to 12%. When you're down at 10 and 12%, uh, you'll do anything. And it's crazy. And that's the other part of why you don't make it over someone that does. Uh, food in your refrigerator will only be safe to eat after about 24 hours. It's after 24 hours, it's anything in a refrigerator is gone. If you try to eat food after that, you might get away with it. Good luck. That's the way that works. Salmonella is the one that will kill most animals. You know, they'll eat a fish that's been dead for longer, you know. It, once salmonella and other kinds of things get into the foods, uh, that is a terrible way to die. Salmonella has got to be the worst. That's why people that dump animals at dead-end streets where I live, I resent them because those animals are pretty much going to have a horrible death. And they're not going to survive. Keeping food hot at 140 degrees You know, that's cold at 40 degrees or less. You can use streams. There's all kinds of things. I did that with when I drank beer. I don't drink beer anymore. But, you know, and food should be, if it's been sitting at room temperature, exhaustion is number two. Exhaustion is what, because what happens is you're running on adrenaline, and uh, at some point you burn out with electrolytes. Like I am right now. I need to (laughs) pump out. No, no. You know, when you pump out, you burn the electrolytes, and everybody knows about emergency, right? Just a quick quick yeah, go. note here, just because I, it's a good point, and I won't think about it later. If you're in a situation that's not like crisis where you've got to run really fast, I mean, obviously, if it's life and death and you've got to run to get away from something that's about to kill you or eat Zombies. you, then you've got to do it. But if you're in a situation where you're in the long haul, try to... You know, if, if you've got adrenaline flowing, you're, it's got fight or flight, and it's going to be pushing you to run and go fast. But try to keep going at such a pace that you're not sweating and you're not breathing hard. Again, if it's life and death, you've got to do whatever you've got to do, of course. But when it's not life and... If it's nothing in immediate threat to you, think you're going to conserve... You want, you've got to conserve everything you've got when all of a sudden you don't have access to stuff. That means you've got to conserve warmth, it got to means you got to conserve dryness, keeping yourself dry instead of wet and out of the elements. It means you have to conserve energy and you have to conserve water. And if you're breathing hard and sweating, then you're wasting precious energy that may be what you need to keep your life going the next day or the next day or the next day. So, very important point. You know, like the Fremen did in Dune. Yeah, <laughs> in Dune, you, right. Well, that's what they did. They collected well, their sweat act- and their urine, and you drank it back in us. That was a still suit. Yeah. Actually, it brings up another point. In cold, cold weather, when, if, you're, if it's winter time and it's cold and dry, your body's skin wants to maintain a certain level of moisture and humidity on the skin surface. So mountaineers will have a moisture vapor barrier and, and you'll keep your socks dry and your feet will stay warmer. If you can have some extra baggies or a longer term nylon sock, you put it over your skin underneath your sock. And if, you're, and if your boots are maybe wet, maybe you put another bag in the outside of your sock because what happens is 
is that you'll need to consume much more water, and if it's cold, that means melting snow, either with body heat, which you may not have much of to spare, or fuel, which you may also not have much of to spare. And so if you can have a vapor barrier around your body, it will maintain a high moisture level on your skin, and your body won't keep, like, sucking water through the body and evaporating out to try and keep your skin moist. Plus, it'll keep your clothing dry. And for instance, if you're in like really cold climate and you have a down bag, that bag will lose loft every day and will get colder and colder every day because your body moisture will be going through the bag and, and warm, moist air coming off your skin goes through the bag and it hits the cold outer layer on the bag and it condenses into frost. And so day by day by day, that down bag is going to get less and less and less warm and less and less less loft. And you're going to have to drink and thaw more water. These are just little tips I know from, you know, being a mountaineer and an extreme backcountry person. And, yes? And also, too, like, it, it takes, like, on average, like, 24 hours to dry out a bag. And, like, it down. sure does. Yeah. 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 It sure does. Yeah. Especially if it's cold. So let's hear it for Pendleton okay. and wool. Why? Yes. <laughs> because wool, when it gets wet, that's the first rule that I taught SEALs. You never allow yourself to get wet. Yep. If you can keep dry, it doesn't matter how cold it gets. Wool and fiber fill. The modern... What it does is it heats up yep. and dries out fast. And wool is what I wear. I wear wool. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I layer. Wool and is when great. When we get into it, I'll talk about uh, certain kinds of animal skins that seals use if we're going into the deep woods. When you're in deep snow... There's a difference in the way you approach your environment than if you're going into a desert. And mostly, I was up in deep snow. You know, I, where we went, and when I, SEAL Units won, we were, did a no, lot like a of cold sack. weather. And it's you like can a, guess where that liner. is. <laughs> I'm going to just liner. let you think about that one. Um, Staying calm, back. learning how to control your mind. The bottom line, the mind is a little black kid. It wants to go all over the place. And the key is to have it work for you. And you don't let it drive you, you drive it. And that's gonna take some practice. That's what tomorrow's about, that's what training is about, that's what, you know, the same and same. Herbs, herbs can save you. Now this is where I was the MacGyver. I learned how to go out into the environment, and every environment's different, or habitats. And each habitat, is set up with its own basic sets of chemistries that are identical in other communities and other habitats. They, like golden, we'll talk about one like golden seal that's an east coast to earth. We have Oregon grapefruit out there which has hydrostine and barbarian, identical chemistry. Once you know that and you know your chemistries, you can go for it. I forgot to take my course out this morning. Okay. <laughs> oh no, I, that's what keeps me. Uh-oh, you might, you might fall asleep at the end of the day without your no, cordyceps. I, I was that missing time thing. I'm not sure what was going on when they hit me with that BC gas. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, herbs, uh, there's charcoal, is a primary one from your campfire. That can save your life. Slippery elm. Uh, slippery elm is a laxative. There's all kinds of other things out there that you can do, a rotor rooter. Uh, skull cap, there's other kinds of medicines out there that are used for sedation and pain. Now we come to part four, sanitation. Sanitation is the other place that's going to kill you, and you don't even think about it. I, uh, when I did my uh, thing in, in uh, Hilo, I gave every single person a little chocolate-covered raisin, and I said, pretend that that was a piece of feces. Do you know how much bacteria, <laughs> viruses, and blah, 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 or in that little tiny raisin? I mean, half the people can eat it. <laughs> uh, our sanitation is always based on water and gallons of hot, steamy, and soapy water. But when water, even with a trucky, you know, when water becomes a situation, now you're going to have to think about how to do cleanliness and other kinds of things on a totally different level where your habits change. And most are going to be totally unprepared. You know, when you flush the toilet, do you have any idea how much water you're using with each flush? That's crazy. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's the way we live. That's why Matt last night said something to the effect, 
that the amount a small child in America uses compared to someone in China. Was, well, China's increasing. Yeah, it, it, an African child is equal, it, it takes about 10 African kids to impact the same as one American kid. And it takes about five Chinese kids to impact the same as one American kid. And about one and a half to two Europeans. So right, now that picture there shows you that in a time of, of disaster, the first thing you do to your body, you cut your toenails and your fingernails down to the nubs. No more fingernails, ladies. It's like that is where all your bacteria gets, and guess what you're doing with it. And that's why your mouth is possibly even worse than your, your lower bowel. And it actually, if you, in the mind control study I said, I would say by weight, the physical body and you are only 10%, and the rest of your weight is water transport systems and bacteria vying for homeostasis. That's why everybody's different, because they have different bacteria. You are mostly a bunch of bacteria and water transport systems moving it around. And less than 10% of you is actually your bone and your, yeah. And also, too, like, um, being on farms, like, we've had people that would come onto the farm that had never really had contact with animals. Or oh! Birds. I like just the dog. Like, you put them out. Well, just like, one little um, splinter caused a huge infection in my dog's eye. And it's like, it was like a whole thing. And then they found out that they had some kind of bacteria in their blood. And then they had to go to the hospital. Wow. Well, that's because... So if, you, if you're not used to being... That's right. Your body takes time. System. To adjust to new situations and habitats. You know, there's a, there's a, a there's hysteresis, if you will, going from here to being able to be on the farm and not be exposed to that. Now, I'm going to say something further than some metaphor that you need to hear. So, uh, Max White, for example, is extremely sensitive to black mold. If the black mold is present, and most people don't even just blow it off, if, if there's any mold present at all, she's going to have a problem. And uh, now, that's a good thing and a bad thing, because it limits where she can go, and she has a better early warning system than anybody else in the room does. So, but it's like allergies, they're part of the parasympathetic nervous system, and that means you can reprogram it, and what you have to do individually is make that decision of how important it is to have that limitation or to not notice it. And everybody's a little different, and what you do is keep a diary so that you decide where you want to be in that in that sliding scale of things. Black mold is a killer. And everybody up in Oregon where I am, there are certain forests that you can't live in the forest. You can go through and find the forest, but if you lived in the forest where you're breathing it on a regular basis, you would be toxic. And that's the first thing that when FEMA goes through, uh, you know, get you know, saving people and you know, the first thing they do is black mold before they do anything else with black mold. And most people don't realize that, but you can adjust your responses to these things. It's not that you're stuck with it. It's do you want to keep that or do you want to limit it a little bit? Is that black mold sinks up you find on dead leaves and things like that? I'm sorry, sir. Black mold, is that the same thing? No, you no, it's not. No, no, no. Black moles, you'll find them in the lichens and uh, uh, mosses and other kinds of interfaces where water has been allowed to let certain other habitat molds get in. There are all kinds of molds. Yeah. Black mold is a specific one that well, uh, is airborne. There's, there's a variety of black molds. I'm an expert on it because my wife almost died from it. Yeah, and uh, so we, had, we happened to rent a house in Hawaii that was infested in the walls, hidden in the walls with Stachybotrys, the most famous, infamous black mold, Aspergillus and Fusarium. So we had three of the most, four most infamous toxic black molds. And uh, you know, it, it's trippy because the doctors were trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Came home one day, and my mother-in-law was lying on the couch saying, I don't know what's wrong with me, I can barely move, I feel like I'm dying. My wife's caring for her and then three or four days later she's feeling the same way. And then she's, she'd say, look, and she'd pull her shirt up, and it looked like someone had beaten her with whips and chains, and it was all bruised and ugly, like you know, black and blue and yellow and stuff, and uh, went to the doctors. So I'm just telling you this because 
it's valuable information to know, and the medical people are, for the most part, totally in the dark. And as a contractor in Hawaii, I was required to provide medical insurance for my crew, so we had Kaiser, and asked the doctor specifically, do you think mold could be doing this? He said, no, no, no. Trust me, I'm a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and, Who told uh, me that trust me means... So <laughs> we, we, we looked, my, we, my wife was pretty, had the suspicion, she's very intuitive, Excellent. it was mold. We searched the internet, saw pictures of the spontaneous hemorrhaging under the skin, Statubotrys poisoning, it's like, that's what we got. We found a mold expert on Oahu, tested her blood, called us back and said, you've got Statubotrys in the blood, you've got to get out of this house now. Uh, within it, next stage is, is brain and lung hemorrhaging followed by death. She's probably two weeks away from dying if we stayed in the house. It killed the prior owner. After 13 months in the house, he dropped dead in the toilet one day. They, the new owners bought the house, the quote, mold pit basement. They stripped everything, refurbished it, repainted it, but not, no real mold remediation. We moved in. Uh, other than hearing a workman say, wow, that was a real mold pit down there, but, you know, looked fine, smelled fine. We were totally unaware. Year went by, it was fine. The second year, wettest winter in 100 years. The gulch nearby turned into a raging river and flooded into the half basement a couple times. We smelled the smell of cat urine. That's the smell of statubotrys going off. We thought it was cats that had been under part of the house on piers, and the wet weather had just brought out the smell of the cats. That's one of the first warnings for you that are not sensitive to black mold. Is if you smell cat urine, just make an assumption that 50% of that is something else that you don't want to be exposed to. Okay. So I've said enough on there. If anybody has specific questions on that later, catch me. But yeah, it's, it's such point. an important Molds topic important. that I just thought I'd, I'd take a couple minutes out. And that's how we're going to be doing this. We've got our PowerPoints, your questions or bring up topics. We'll spend a few minutes on it and move on. Okay, I'd like to draw your attention to the last statement. 50% of all children under five that die is because of diarrhea caused by poor sanitation. You, right out of the gate, you should teach your kids you know, about their fingernails and uh, putting things in their mouth. It's, um, this is uh, long fingernails. Over 15 funguses, bacteria, and viruses are commonly found. And uh, look at that scale there. It's like unbelievable. And if you have a mustache and you're doing like what you're doing right now, sir, uh, just like you are, <laughs> then you're going to have little gidgets in your thing, and then you're going to have, and that's how it works. I'm just kidding you. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. High percentage is that's where most people, and that's the little raisin game I play there. Look at how much that. When 100 million viruses in one little ball like that, and one million bacteria, 100, 1,000 parasite cysts, and 100 parasite eggs, just in one gram. Well, that makes me so hungry. Ah, oh, yeah. Anybody up for Yes, sir. Doctor, uh, you have a good point there. How about being a contrarian of that? Uh, I've heard that we have to be a lot of people that are very uh, 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 healthy and uh, freaked out on uh, the sanitize and whatnot. They're really afraid of bacteria. And so they actually create an opportunity to get more sick. And isn't a certain amount of that to help? Homeopathic them? medicine. <laughs> Take a little bit of the poison and let your body freak out and create antibodies. Um, yes and no. Um, I'm of two minds of that. I will play two-faced. <laughs> you call it that. I'm of two minds of that. Um, that's a, a tough one because uh, really nothing bad, including black mold. It's all there for a reason. And what you're trying to do is find your center in that whole scheme that's called sustainability where you're not affecting the environment and it not affecting you yeah that's what they used to call microbiotics where you eat your environment you know you habitat you 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 climatize to a given region like i don't know if you guys i'm drinking way more water here than up where i live i'm noticeably more parched why is that? It's dry. Yeah, and there's aliens here or something. There's something weird going on here. But it's dry. Yeah, right. It's dry. Well, he had, we had ice on my vehicle this morning up at his house. So, yeah. Okay. Now imagine the grid going down and you're living in New York and you're six flights up. And you have to take a dump. 
Are you going to go down into the street and do it? Where, I mean, this is uh, people in cities are not going to be nearly as prepared as you. And what is actually when the grid goes down, the most people will probably be in India, China, uh, and places where they're semi uh, uh, educated but not prepared. Uh, uh, Aborigine, a bushman, you know, in Adelaide or someplace like that, you think he's going to have a problem when the grid goes down? Why? So there you go. That's a good focus. Let's say the most important thing that you leave out of this conference today is that each one of you needs to start a little fist in the air, stands with a fist, you know, where you do something that is moving you away from your current lifestyle. Just a little bit, Garden. I'm This year, my project is to take my Restored 280Z and I'm going to run it off my garden where I grow comfrey and I have a still and I'm going to run it off alcohol. And right now, that's my project for this year, where I don't need petroleum products anymore. I'll put red line oil in it and I'm finished with Iraq. And that's that. Uh, no, I mean, you put red line oil in it, you don't need to change your oil anymore. You know, and if you have alcohol, and I did a study just in myself on the bricks of sugar for alcohol out of comfrey. And Matt's got a great design. I'm going to say something. that Everybody should have a project like that. Something that you're doing, you know, for your food, put up some pickles. <laughs> you know, this year. So, something. A little project. The way you make your own clothing or whatever. Compost toilets. Matt will talk more about. Bleach is your friend. That is the way you do it. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about a weapon now that I'd like all of you to think about, because in my country, there are a bunch of macho machismos, oh, I'll just go get my rifle and go shoot something to eat it, right? What is going to be the first thing after drugs that the, the zombies go for? Weapons. Which means if you're not carrying a weapon, you're not as much of a target, potentially. But you want something to defend yourself, we'll talk about what I would recommend. The best weapon I've seen is a small water pistol full of ammonia. <laughs> that, that, will, that will stop the raging dog. That will stop a grizzly bear. That will stop everything. A, a little squirt of ammonia, it's not illegal, like pepper spray might be, or have to get right up to them with a taser, you know, whatever. You want to have a little water pistol and go squirt, squirt? When I was 10 years old, I was coming home from grade school, or uh, junior high, there was a, a big steep hill, I'd always get on my bicycle and go down fast, and this dog would come out at me every day, coming home. And one day, I tried to avoid him, and I fell on my bicycle and came home bloody. And my dad is the one that gave me the water pistol and filled it with ammonia. Dad was a Navy. <laughs> and I came down the hill, that dog came at me, I hit him once in the face, I never saw that dog again. He never chased another bicycle, he didn't do anything, he was behaving himself. Now, no, no, there's, ammonia is illegal, because it's a household, you know, thing. And a water pistol, if you especially have a little good water pump where you can shoot a big one spray 40 feet. You know, we do water cannon. <laughs> It'll stop a crowd in quickness. <laughs> All right. Um, part five is your heat, fuel, and cooling. Now, you need to think about how you're going to keep your food, how you're going to keep your body, and there's lots of little logic things. And this is a typical after, after the zombie attack where everybody's sitting around a campfire and they're sharing foods and blah, 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 and you'll notice there's disaster. Keeping warm without gas or electricity is not that hard. In fact, uh, what I like to do most, one of the projects I do every winter, is I go hunt big cats up at Crater Lake with a camera, and I go in with snowshoes, and I take big pictures of them, and I get right up close and shoot them. And um, I, it's been really cold up at Crater Lake. You know, you can get to 20 below zero, even lower. And you, you can bank in, if you get into the snow, it acts as an insulator. You know, it's, it's long as you stay dry. If you get wet, you're in trouble. And if, so that's the first rule. Always stay dry. 